Ô, Dente, tá ficando com cara de americano mesmo, cara. Cara de ator de, de Hollywood aí, cara. <risos> ah, é. Eu comece... comecei a transmitir agora, Anderson. Ah, tá bom. Só porque eu... ontem eu tentei e não funcionou. Se eu quis iniciar um pouquinho antes. Pra... A gente já tá ao vivo lá? Me dá... Ao vivo. É. Me dá dois minutos e eu já volto. Cara de americano mesmo, cara. Cara de ator de Hollywood aí, cara. Bom dia, Luiz. Bom dia, Alisson. Bom dia. Eu vou tirar minha câmera, então, para não, não atrapalhar muito a transmissão. Uh, Luis, can you share with me a YouTube link in the chat? What, you, Or you, you, what do you need, Danny? The, uh, the, you, the... A link for the YouTube transmission for the YouTube ah, broadcast. Okay. Just a moment. Uh, yes. There you are. Okay, thank you. Thank, thanks, Luis. Another, another question: Does it have to be a Brazilian style or American style? Okay. Just any style. You, in, you. I mean, in, ter in terms of time, because do I have to be very constrained with time? Because people here are no. very. No. Can I be like speak for three hours? <laughs> you can, but you most certainly will lose the audience. You will kill. So, no, I mean, but don't, I we we don't have uh, constraints on time, and uh, if the discussion is interesting, it goes on. Of course, if this goes on too long, it will be difficult for people to stay. But but you can, you don't need to worry about that so much. Okay. Okay, that's good. All right. So let me know when I should start. Yeah, let's try to share your screen and then I make the introduction. Oh, yeah. Good, great. We you see your screen. Very good. Danny, you are mute. Yes, I, I was talking to another person. Okay, so let's start then. So welcome to the Heliophysics and Space Geophysics Seminars promoted by the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research, INPI. In particular, this seminar is hosted by the Space Geophysics Postgraduate Program at our institute and by the Research in Heliophysics Project, which is sponsored by our CAPES funding agency. Our guest today is Dr. Dani Oliveira from NASA Heliophysics Division. Dr. Oliveira is currently a research scientist in the Heliophys Heliophysics Division of NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He received his bachelor and master's degree from the University of Sao Paulo here in Brazil. And he received his PhD in space science from the University of New Hampshire 
he studied the geoeffectiveness of interplanetary shocks under Joachim Heber. His research area includes uh, magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere coupling, geomagnetic storms, and interplanetary shocks. This last with the MMS support to track inclined shocks effects in the magnetosphere. Dr. Oliveira is, a, is in a unique position to offer with his research a system level analysis of the thermosphere during storms. He has uh, synthesized decades of satellite observations to provide the global responses to storms of different strengths and thus quantify how the impact satellite drag. Dr. Oliveira's recent research has used uh, contemporary and historical data sets to examine how extreme storms change Earth's atmosphere and create significant satellite drag forces. So on behalf of INPI, I would like to thank Dr. Oliveira for accepting our invitation to present this seminar on the thermosphere mass density modeling during extreme magnetic storms, which is of course a theme, a topic of interest of our research here at INPI. So we ask the audience to mute their microphone during the presentation and uh, you all can ask questions at the end or if you prefer, you can write the questions at the chat. You or some of us will be happy to read the questions at the end and, uh, and then it's all yours, Danny, thank you. All right, thank you, Alison, for the kind introduction. Thank you to the organizers of the seminar for this kind invitation to present my work. I'm very thrilled to be here talking to you today. So uh, the topic of my research, one of my research topics is satellite orbital drag during magnetic storms. And I'll be talking about what we know of this phenomenon and how they affect our current technology, our satellites in space. And I'll give you a little bit of um, some historical introduction and to see where we came from and where we are going to. Uh, so the reason I'll be focusing on today region here, usually described as below 1000 kilometers altitude and the satellites of interest uh, are usually in altitudes below 600 kilometers. And at the end of this uh, top, this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about my ideas, my perspective on this uh, area in future years and decades. And I'll show you very preliminary data we got from SpaceX related to Starlink and our minor a minor geomagnetic storm that brought down a few satellites just last month in February, 2022. And I'm working here at NASA with FTES ASTA, my main collaborator. And I have many other collaborators in this work, in, not only here in the United States, but also in Japan and other areas as well. So let me start talking a little bit about the physics of what what's going on here. So we have doing geomagnetic storms. We have like, for example, storms caused by CMEs, coronal mass ejections. This animation here on the top left is going to repeat itself for some time. Then we have a CME that impacts Earth and there's all the process, magnetic reconnection, energy that goes to the, to the tail and goes back to the ionosphere through field line currents. And these currents, these particles hit the magnetosphere, right? They hit the, 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 uh, the upper atmosphere, the neutrals in the upper atmosphere. So when you have geomagnetic storms, we have intensification of field line currents and there is mechanical collisions between plasmas, plasma and neutrals uh, in the ionosphere. So as you know, when a gas get, gets heated, it, it moves upward. So the neutral upwelling, that layer moves upward because of the heating. And then here on the right, you see this plot from PROS 2011. Uh, so when you have the upwelling, a satellite that's passing there, for example, at 260 kilometers altitude, this satellite will face a region with enhanced uh, particles there, enhanced density. 
that creates additional drag forces that are that can be detrimental to the satellite. So these forces can reduce the satellite's lifetime and can impact the, the satellite tracking and satellite um, uh, people who track the satellite orbits. So they have a hard time determining where the satellites are. And that's a factor that may increase the risk of collision of satellites, particularly now, as I'm going to be talking later today, when we have many, many, many more satellites in the upper atmosphere. So everything started with this satellite here, Sputnik, that was launched in 4 October 1957. So this is a very interesting satellite. So that's a very interesting point in history because thanks to well, somehow, thanks to Sputnik, we had the Cold War against the uh, United States, against the Soviet Union, that's now Russia, everybody knows that. And there is, so this satellite had some positive impact in science throughout history because it triggers the federal government of the United States to fund lots of research. And we learn a lot of things. Right in the beginning with Sputnik, we, we learned something. So I'm going to play a video. I hope we can hear just very quickly. So just listen. It saw nothing and heard nothing. All it did was coast and beep. Its batteries died after three weeks. After three months, it fell back into the atmosphere, burned up and was gone. Yeah, that's it. So that was Sputnik. So it, it orbited Earth just for a few weeks. And what's interesting is that it disappeared. So people thought that, so you had the ionosphere. People knew that back in the 1920s with Appleton. People knew the ionosphere. And they thought that everything toward the sun was simply empty. You had nothing. But then you had Sputnik at 400, 500 kilometers altitude, it loses altitude, it's just lost to the ionosphere, pardon me, to the atmosphere. And people realize that, hey, wait a minute, so we have particles there, we have, we have stuff up there, we have direct forces. So that was the first time when we realized that uh, the upper atmosphere can exert direct forces on satellite. And as a matter of fact, it saw nothing and her pardon me. So uh, this is the first observation of drag effects on a satellite. So this was one of the satellites of the Sp Sputnik family. So in the upper panel, we see the AP index. So that was a storm in 1958. Back then, that uh, end of 1950s, we had very, very intense geomagnetic storms back then. So up there in blue is the AP index, and in red is just acceleration, but it's uh, written here in an awkward manner, like minus dp dt, so that would be variation of the period, p is the period, but it's simply, that's simply acceleration. So it's very clear with, from the data from Yakia that's plotted, that was plotted by pros, so this, this storm caused a very intense acceleration due to drag forces. And that caused the satellite to fall. I mean, not to fall, but to decrease the altitude. That was the first time we observed that. And Yakia Bowman in 1959 published a paper in Nature. And he called this uh, drag forces corpuscular radiation, right? So that was related to geomagnetic storms. So people didn't understand as we do today, the causes of magnetic storms and neutral upwelling. And he thought somehow, uh, not that, that accurate, but he had an idea that was caused by this sun, but directly by this sun and called it corpuscular radiation. So that was the first uh, observation. So this is the paper. If anyone who's interested in this area, but it's a kind of an old paper, over uh, uh, older than ten years, but it has a lot of papers concerning observations of drag effects in the upper atmosphere. It's a long paper, and at the end of the paper, the author brings a very extensive list of papers published on the subject. And it's a very interesting guide for anyone who wants to learn about 
dense enhancements during magnetic storms from an experimental perspective. Um, so one thing that's in, very important that I'll be talking about is that uh, accelerometers. So before the year 2000, we had uh, a spacecraft with mass spectrometers where they measure uh, the density composition of the upper atmosphere of the thermosphere. But I'll be focusing on this talk after 2000. I'll explain this in a second. So that's why. So usually density is measured by low Earth orbit LEO satellites. The most famous ones are Champ and Grace. Why are they famous? They are famous because in a very clever way, people place accelerometers at the center of mass of the satellite. So every acceleration that's measured is precisely due to drag forces. Since the accelerometer is placed at the center of mass of the satellite, gravitational forces are canceled. So they cancel out. The only thing you measure is due to drag forces. So and then we have the drag, the drag equation. The drag equation is this equation that's shown here. It's proportional to rho density of the atmosphere or uh, let's say the thermosphere, that's the, the more precise name of the layer. CD is the drag coefficient that depends on the satellite geometry, the external temperature, the material of the, of the satellite and, and other factors. Then you have the ballistic factor, which is the area to mass ratio, and then V squared, where V is the relative speed between velocity of the spacecraft and the, the local wind velocity because we have particles there, therefore we have wind velocity there. And then we measure acceler acceleration due to drag forces. You know, all we have to do, we solve this equation for, for rho and get density. So that's why we focus particularly on satellites with accelerometers placed at their center of masses such as Champ and Grace. Okay, so this is a summary. This is a paper that I published last year. It's a from, a Frontiers in Astronomy Space Sciences. So this paper is a perspective paper where we bring our ideas for the future on which this talk is mostly based on. Uh, so here we have the panel A, we have the, the commission times of the satellites of Champ Grace and other two satellites, Gochi and Swarm. By the way, all the satellites are European missions, basically European missions, but GRACE has NASA instruments there. So uh, we see the, the blue line is CHAMP. So these hiccups you see in the orbit of CHAMP are related to our altitude correction. And then you can see that um, CHAMP lasted from late 2001 to almost 2010, 2011, and so on. So we have GRACE a little bit upper, we have SWARM, and we have GOCHI that's a little bit lower, right? So in, uh, be mostly below 300 kilometers altitude. Due to this reason, uh, GOCHI lasted uh, not as long as the other missions. Panel B, we have local timing hours plotted against altitude. And the color code is the number of observations of, of these satellites, all, all the satellites we see here, during geomagnetic storms. So what we did, we took a zero epoch time and 72 hours after storm onset. And then we superposed all data observations, all data points there, and we came up with this plot here. Well, throughout the years for like 20 years, more or less 20 years, so you can see that there's a pretty good coverage after 400 kilometers in all local times. It's particularly good. It's sparse, it's, uh, it's spread out in time, but we have some observations there. Uh, but however, if you look at Gochi, it's a little bit different because Gochi has a very strong 
uh, coverage between um, um, dawn dusk region, so around 6, 8 hours local time and 18, 20 local time. So because of this, I'm not, we don't really use Gauche Arbit during uh, our superposed pocket analysis because that would bias our results. However, if you look at on panel C, which I call the bird diagram, so those are the same thing. So what we did, we just looked at these events here in panel B, and we extracted the ones that we classified as extreme events. An extreme event is an event with CMH or DST index less than minus 250 nanotesla. As everybody knows, the sun has been really, really quiet. And after 2000, we have had only seven extreme storms. That's very few. That's a serious problem we have to understand how extreme events impact the thermosphere and subsequently satellite orbital dragging Leo. As a matter of fact, the last event we saw, uh, last extreme event occurred on 15 May 2005 almost 17 years ago. So we are really overdue for an extreme event. And that would be great for us to understand better our, uh, uh, the dynamics of the thermosphere during extreme events. So that's very important as I'm going to say later in this talk. So uh, out of all the observations you see here, so, so this is everything we have. Every, everything we know after 2000 com comes from these observations. So let, let me just talk a little bit about some previous results. So here, for example, we have one of the most cited works related to CHAMP data published by Herman Lur and et al. in 2004. So here he plots deceleration or uh, acceleration meters per square second of the satellite of CHAMP when CHAMP was passing uh, in high latitude regions. So all these, he call, people call it the speed humps. It's like when the satellite increase, observes these uh, humps here, this increase, increasing densities in the cusp that's related to the cusp region, I really recommend people to read this paper. It's a short paper, it's a general paper, very nice. So it's related to, to density enhancements. The drag effects are caused by, the, by density enhancements, caused by intensifications of microfuel underlying currents. That's very nice. So that was the first observations of density enhancements in the cusp. It was observed by Leo Lur et al. in 2004. And here, another very famous work. So that's with CHAMP data as well. That was public, uh, published by Bruins Mine Forbes in 2008. It's a GRL paper as well. So it has to do with TADs. It's traveling atmospheric disturbances. It's very clear that after, uh, we know that very well, after geomagnetic storms, there's a lot of energy enters the high latitude regions and because you have that energy being pumped in the atmosphere, the waves are generated and they propagate from high latitudes to low latitudes. And they can e e even, uh, as you can see here, uh, in, I think the, 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 bottom, the top panel is for the day side and the bottom panel was for the, for the night side. And they can propagate from one hemisphere to the other, right? So that's very intense. It's very important to understand the dynamics of these TADs because they control energy momentum distribution in the upper atmosphere during geomagnetic storms. And another paper here by Oliveira et al. in 2017. So the authors looked at superposition of all CHAMP and GRACE data to uh, up to 2015. And they observed that uh, after storm onset, so you have this wave propagation, like uh, the results of wave propagation, the heating and thermocity enhancement that you are synonyms. So when you have these waves propagating from high latitude toward low latitude, it takes approximately three hours. So, so we found for the first time in this paper that 
uh, the energy takes three hours to globalize in the whole system, the whole atmosphere. That's important because uh, model people who write models to understand the upper atmosphere, density in the upper atmosphere, need to know the time cadence, the resolution they need for uh, these models. Usually people use six hours, but we're saying, hey, in three hours, things can be globalized. So you need to be more uh, precise about your uh, time resolution in your data, in your model. Okay, so this is just a, a quick, uh, uh, um, a quick showing of previous results, famous results with Champ and Grace data. So now let me talk a little bit, a little bit about model that we used. This model, it's an empirical model. It's Yakia Bowman 2008 model that we call JB 2008 or JB08, the same thing. It's an empirical model. It's nice. There's a Fortran code online, so you can download it for free from SET, Space Environment Technologies. And then you, you download the indices, you download uh, uh, geomagnetic indices, solar indices, you can run the model in as long as you have latitude, longitude, and altitude, and time, of course, you can calculate density in upper atmosphere anywhere. So what this model does, so that so it comes back from the 1970s after the observation uh, that I show by, by Yakia, Luigi Yakia in 1958, 59. So he started writing lots of models. So he used some equations, diffusive equations, which are, are known as the Yakia equations. And then in 2008, uh, Bruce Bowman published uh, this, this model that's pretty much well, in terms of, uh, as I'm going to talk later, in terms of uh, models that are publicly available out there, is one of the best to calculate density. So what this model does, it calculates an exosphere temperature, T infinite, and then this temperature depends on a lot of things, uh, satellite latitude, a solar declination altitude, and then the local solar time, and then uh, some UV stands for uh, solar radiation. So it uses the F10.7 index, index. And also a few indice, indices were created just for JB08, like depends on the chromos, chromosphere intensity and magnesium uh, levels in the chromosphere. It's very interesting. If you are interested, there's a lot of papers talking about that. But particularly for us, this term is very important because it depends on geomagnetic activity directly on the DST index. So geomagnetic activities, activity within JB08 depends on the DST index. And let me talk about a methodology that we developed with this paper here in 2017. We calculate rho nod with a I'm not going to the detail because there's some mathematical detail here. Uh, if you are interested, I can tell you later or you can read the paper. But essentially we set uh, TGA to zero. So we say, hey, so that's the density. If there was no geomagnetic storm, then we calculate rho naught. And then we have another paper in 2019, a space weather paper when we, we lay out uh, Frame, framework to calculate drag, that's what we do. So using delta rho equals rho observation minus rho naught, the model density here, we calculate DADT. DADT stands, is related to the orbital decay rate. So it's how many meters per second the satellite is decaying at that particular position. So it depends on drag coefficient, area to mass ratio, and delta rho, and some well-known constants like the gravitational constant, Earth's mass, and that's the average of the semi-major axis, A, which is generally corrected due to some orbit uh, perturbations, and also because the, the Earth is not a perfect sphere, so we use some geological uh, equations. So it's described in this paper to account for the no uniformity of the Earth's surface. Then after that, 
we simply integrate this, this equation along the satellite track and to get how, how much the satellite decay. So that's the orbital, total orbital decay. That's the, uh, how much the satellite decay due to this storm. Just another word. So because we calculate delta rho, that's so because we are subtracting the background density. So what comes from these calculations is due only to storm effects. So that's why it subtracts rho from the storm time density observations. So pretty much that's the model, the framework we use to calculate density and also to calculate uh, the background density from which we derive the storm time orbital decay rate and total orbital decay during geomagnetic storms. And this is an example that we published in 2019, Space Weather. So that storm is a well-known storm in 2003. So in 19, um, in November 2003, so that was the most extreme storms observed that occurred within Champ and Grace area, era with CMH almost like minus 400 something nanotesla it was a huge storm. It was a clean storm because it was quiet before you had this storm and then came, um, came back to quiet again. So this is an explanation, an example of the equations I just showed. Uh, so the blue line is just data. We didn't do anything. So we just plot, we're just plotting here data from uh, observed by uh, which, oh, I'm sorry by, I think it's, um, this is Grace here. Oh yeah, so I'm saying here, uh, at 480 kilometers altitude. This is the ADT. Oh, by the way, the orange line is the model that comes from the model. You see that before a storm, it kind of it's, uh, agrees very well. So there's a little bit of under, um, under predicts a little bit before storm. So the first vertical line is the shock. The second vertical line is the storm onset. And then we have the, the green line is the ADT. And then we integrate. When we integrate the green line, okay, the bottom panel, the blue line is the integration of the green line. In, in the orange line is the calculation of the natural orbital decay if there was no storm, okay? So take a look at that. The satellite would decay like uh, 10 meters if there was no storm, but due to this storm, it, did, it decayed by 80 meters. That's quite a lot. So that would be a very, that would provoke a very severe impact over time. Imagine an extreme storm happening every month, like once a month, and you have an additional 70, 80, or 100 meters a decay of 100 meters a month. That would be very impactful to a, to a satellite to the lifetime. So this is something that we really need to be concerned about. It looks just 70 meters, just looks just a little, but if you take over time, like 10 years, 12 years, or even 15 years, that can be very impactful. Now, on the second column, we have the same thing, the same calculation, but instead of observations, we have the model. So that's what JB gave us. Well, it's not perfect. Although the model captures the dynamics of the storm very well, you can see the up and down. And by the way, these curvy things here, the sinusoidal things here are uh, orbital effects. So the maximum here is when the satellite's passing through uh, high latitudes High latitude or our regions like the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. That's why you have these peaks like uh, sino sinusoidal things. And the model has some problems. So it misses the peaks during storming phase. It's uh, expected. But what is revealed is that this model is overestimating density during recovery. That's because uh, I'm going to say later why this, we think the model is not capturing because in reality, the thermosphere is cooling, but the model doesn't know that. The model doesn't know what to do because there is something missing in the model that I'm going to talk about later. 
And the purple line is the ADT, the same thing. And at the end of the day, when we integrate the purple line, we get this blue line here. It's not bad because uh, the model underestimates main phase and overestimates recovery phase by the end of the day. So it's just like 10% off, it's not bad. So the model does considerably a good job, but we need to improve it to, to make things more accurate. So that's the results we published in 2019 when compare, we compare data with model uh, calculations. Uh, okay. Um, all right, so just uh, now I'm comparing JB08 with HASDA. So here I already talked about this. So this is how we use JB08. And JB08 is a good model for forecasting prediction, right? But it's not good for now casting because we, need, we have another one. It's like high accuracy satellite drag model, which is called HASDA. Hasden is the most accurate model we have out there, but there is a caveat. Hasden is classified. It's sold by the United States Space Force that used to be called Air Force. And one doesn't go out there and run the model. So that doesn't exist. You need to have authorization, special authorization to do that. But recently uh, data, the output from this model has been uh, published, published by Tobiska et al., but in Ken Tobiska from SET, made these um, its outputs available. It's online on his website, and you can download the data, but it's very limited, but we're getting there. We, at least we have something. And what this, this model does, that's very interesting. I wish you hear what I'm going to say because I'm going to mention that later. That's a, an important key point of this talk. Because Hasden using 75, more or less 75 specification satellites to correct density, what it does, it, what happened? Okay. What it does, it, it uh, corrects JB08 density due to observation of the 75 satellites is a correction. So those are calibration satellites. And that's because Hasden is more uh, accurate than JB08, but we can use it yet. So who knows one day we can do that. So this is a comparison that I published in this Frontiers paper. We just, take, we just took here the seven extreme geomagnetic storms observed during uh, Champ and Grace era. Panel A, we see observations. Panel B, JB08 estimates. And panel C, has them. So let me tell you what we're plotting here. We are plotting local uh, epoch time, where zero epoch time is the storming phase onset, plotted as a function of latitude and we beam the data, each beam corresponds to the log of low over or not, which is uh, the observation over the model quiet density. And we take the log, we have a sense of storm variation. That's essentially what we're doing. So this is observation. So we see TADs propagating from highlight to effects of TADs propagate from high latitudes toward equatorial regions. And we showed before that on average for all storms it's three hours, but here it's less than uh, two hours, 1.5 hours within the first orbit. Each orbit is 90 minutes, then you have one orbit, then energy is everywhere. Everything is globalized. But JB08 did a poor job. Unfortunately, the JB08 is not capable of detecting these TAD propagations, it did a poor job. But, but uh, Hasdan did well. I mean, it did well, did better in comparison to JB. It's closer to observations than, much closer to observations than JB08. Although observations you see here, that observations, we see a clear cooling of the thermosphere. 
So what happens is during extreme storms, we have this large amount of uh, a large amount of nitric oxide, right? So the nitric oxide, they know, they have a very poor, very powerful cooling effect on the thermosphere. So they oscillate at uh, six point three. Uh, micrometers, uh, the frequency, the wavelength, and they radiate, radiate heat back into space, right? So they are very, we showed with another paper in 2019, it's a GRL paper, we predict that's related to nitric oxide enhancements here. So JB08 kind of captures the sudden cooling in all latitudes, very nice, but Observation, so there's an, another secondary cooling that JB doesn't capture it. Uh, uh, in fact, it captures it later. It has, has then does a better job for the cooling. However, look at that. After 36 or 40 hours after storming phase, we still have the, dense, the thermosphere hot. The, 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 the thermosphere is still hot due to the enhancements in density. But you don't see that in observations, nor do you see that in Hasden simulations. This, we think this is related to the fact that the model doesn't have GBO8, doesn't have nitric oxide effects. So that's because it's not cooling, right? So you don't, so the dense, the model is not capable of capturing the cooling. So here in this panel, finally, we have uh, the error the error, the relative error between JB observations and has the new observations. If you look at has done, the red line, has done is doing quite well during storm times. It's most of the time we think the plus minus 5% uh, relative error confidence interval suggested by the US Space Force. But look at um, JB during storming phase, there is a huge underestimation of density. And then during recovery phase, there's a huge overestimation of density. So we have two problems we need to solve. During storm times, density is low. Then it's, it's, uh, density is, is uh, lower than it should be. It, during recovery times, density is higher than it should be. We should fix that. And that's why when we calculate density at the decay uh, with JB, so kind, so the arrows kind of canceled each other out. But we still have much work to do. We have to improve this. And I'll give you the reasons why in a second. Okay, so let's move on. Now let's talk a little bit about history. So here we have superstorms. We have four superstorms that occur in the past. We, we call, in, in, in this talk, in this paper here, it's another paper in 2020, we call historical storms, storms that occurred before the year 2000, right? When we had Champagne Grace. So we have four storms, October, November, 1903, March, 1989. Everybody knows this one that took down the, the Quebec power transmission system in 1989. We have May, 1921 storm. So this is storm uh, stopped trains in, in New York City and caused fires there. It, it, so that is called the railroad storm. And then se September 1909, I don't remember anything special about this one. And I remember that this October, November, that was the Halloween storm in 1903, exactly 100 years before 2003. So that was the first storm where people reported uh, GIC problems re related to the to telegraphic systems in the Iberian Peninsula in Europe, Portugal, in Spain. So what I'm showing this, I'm showing this because I want to compare two things, storm effects of two storm features. First, the storm intensity, and second, the storm duration. So these storms we have here, the color area represent the storm duration. Storm duration. Panels A and B show storms that lasted more or less the same time, about 12, 14 hours. But one storm is what was way more intense than the other. And on the other panel, other panels C and D, we have two storms, one short-lived and the other long-lived, 
but they had more or less the same intensity. We're going to compare effects of that. So by the way, so if you are interested so to see, so you can see there is a dagger here, the ST dagger. So that's because this index was calculated before 1957, after the International Geophysical Year. And here is the regular DST index that we have. So Jeff Love and Hisashi Hawakawa, they publish, publish a lot of papers where they describe how they calculate this index, DST dagger. I'm not going into details here, but people who are interested, I, I strongly recommend you to check these papers because the way we calculated these index, indices is very similar to the way they calculate the current DST index. So let's see. Remember, storm duration and storm intensity. How do they play each other out? So here are the effects. All right, so let's go through this. So panels A2 and B2, so we have here in all panels the ADT, top row, and D, the, the integral, bottom row, for comparing October 1903, let's just say the year, 1903, 1921, okay? So it is expected the more intense the storm, 1921, drags the more, uh, uh, causes the more uh, intense drag effects, right? So that's expected. But now let's compare two storms with the same intensity, but one is longer than the other. So 1989 is longer, so that's why, that's why it caused the most intense, most severe drag effects when you compare 1989 with 1909. Now, let's compare one that was weaker, but very long, which was 1989, with one that was very short, but strong, which is 1921, right? So, Usually people think the more intense storm, storm causes, induces the more severe geomagnetic effects or the most, most severe space weather effects. We are showing this paper that's not quite true all the time because 1989 caused way more extreme, more severe effects in comparison to 1921 storm. So what we're showing here is that for orbital drag effects, the storm duration can be a major role, a more important role, more important storm feature in dragging, in causing uh, drag forces, drag effects, in comparison to storm intensity. And we published these results for the first time in space weather. So this is the paper that we published, published this. And as I like the ideas, and they picked up our story and pub published this as a uh, NASA Life Science, like a, a press release of our work. So I can post the link for you if you are inter interested. It's very nice. So it came out in 2020, end of 2020. So that's how we can use historical data, right? So we are still working with Hisashi Hayakawa, Jeff Love, and others, and people from the I need data from Brazil, if anybody knows some historical data from ground magnetometers in low latitude regions like Brazil. I'm talking to people from the National Observatory in Brazil to get data from the observatory named Vassouras in Rio de Janeiro. And we're getting very interesting data. If you know anything, any data book you find somewhere, please let me know that we can make things out of it. So that's very interesting. We can create a catalog of historical events based on the ST like data. It's very nice. Okay. Now, so much for the past. Let's talk a little bit about the future. So here we have uh, what we think. So this was published in this Frontiers paper. Uh, this is some personal view, some uh, my personal view of the future of this field. So everybody knows of Starlink. Starlink is a mission that was first 12,000 satellites, but they just got approved for 30,000 satellites. They are launching massive amounts of satellites up in space. So that's a pro problem. I mean, so you need to take care of the satellites in space. And then uh, you have Starlink. 
And then one app, Amazon Sellers, Telesat, are other companies that did the same, right? Uh, and then how can you, how, so how can you take care of these satellites? So you heard last month that SpaceX lost uh, 39 out of 40, 48 satellites due to a minor storm. So the storm happened just a day after the launching of the spacecraft. So that's a problem. So there was a huge loss in terms of not only the monetary loss. So you have people lost money, but think of the, the work that people had to do to come up with satellites, to launch the satellites and everything. And they lost everything just a day they lost everything to a minor geomagnetic storm. So we need to create tools. We need to understand space weather, particularly. So if that happened for a minor storm, imagine for a moderate and even extreme event, right? Intense and extreme event. So one way we can do that, you can use machine learning. So what we're doing now, so here at NASA, I'm going to talk more about this. We are getting data from SpaceX a huge amount of data of several satellites. And we need people to analyze this data. We need people with experience in data analysis and people who know, who know machine learning techniques or deep learning, whatever you call it, uh, data simulation, artificial intelligence. If you bring tools to the table, we are very happy uh, to have people helping with this. And we are going to look at this, the data from these thousands and thousands of satellites. So we really need help with this. Um, and this is an example from very fresh off the oven. So this is what happened with this satellite number 3165 from Starlink. So we just got this data. Actually, I made this plot yesterday. <laughs> it's very recent. And what we see here is DST, top panel, right? And the second panel from top to bottom is altitude of the satellite. It's clear that the satellite's decreasing. It's losing altitude, considerable altitude. And then we have here uh, um, um, density, that I estimated density. So. It's very preliminary. So we see that this DST index is not even, it's a, a preliminary data. It's, it's not uh, um, permanent data yet, but we see that probably there was some, uh, like uh, some dip of DST and we have enhancements of data here. Probably when the satellite was crossing uh, high latitude regions. And then we have density, we have the ADT, and that's what we got for the decay. So just due to storm, so we have the satellite losing uh, approximately 25 meters. So you see, if there was no storm, the satellite would decay like no more than five meters during the storm time, but it decayed by a lot, right? So it decayed by more than 25 meters due to a very minor storm. So this is one. This was one of the forty-eight satellites that survived. The other sat satellites, we don't even have data because they entered the atmosphere and they simply disintegrated. So that's a very interesting thing that we need to look at because we need. Oh, I'm saying 30, 48, but it's forty-nine satellites, and we need to be very careful because uh, these companies need understanding uh, of space weather effects. How space weather is dynamic in order to um, prevent this from happening. So the losses of this spacecraft and even collisions between spacecraft in space, okay? So this is very interesting, very new uh, Starlink results and we have more data to analyze. We have more things to do. So, all right, so one thing we need to do uh, I'm going to show an example of a machine, learn te machine learning technique, uh, how we can use that to help us understand density enhancements of thermosphere dynamics during storms. So what we see here is F10.7 index that's available since um, 
in the 1940s, 1947, if I recall well. And the black line is observations. And then we use machine, a machine learning technique uh, you named uh, regression analysis. And we do the following. The red line is just when we use only sunspot numbers as a variable to predict. So what we do is we have observations, we train the model, we teach the model how to predict the data, in this case, F10.7, and then we ask the model. So what, what would the data look like if we had only sunspot numbers and we get the red line? What about if we had sunspot numbers plus area, the area covering the sunspot numbers, and then we get a blue line. And what about if we had sunspot number plus area plus solar plage, which related to, to the intensity? I think I never understood very well, this very well. So we get the, the, the green line, okay? So it seems like the model is doing pretty well. And here is the standard deviation. Uh, so as more, uh, as you add more variables to your model, the model knows better. The model gets you better estimates. So that's the, uh, that's the kind of stuff we need to do with data, right? Uh, with the Starlink data. We need more people to analyze this data with this kind of techniques and others in order to predict density. And then we extrapolate that to extreme events and we prove the models that will take care of satellites in space in the future, okay? So this is a very clear example of how we could use machine learning techniques to predict uh, density in the upper atmosphere. Now, that's a very interesting plot. I really love this because it summarizes what we see now, what we had in the past, where we're going to in the future. So this plot shows yearly sunspot numbers plotted as a function of time of year. So uh, here, um, these vertical lines are famous storm that you can see the Carrington event here. Then we have one 1872, then this is 1909, yellow is 1921, uh, in blue is 1957. That's the year when the space age was inaugurated with the launching of Sputnik that I showed, whose animation I showed before. Curiously, this period coincides with the very, the highest sunspot number, the maximum we have. That's very curious, right? So that's a great coincidence. And then when the first satellite went orbit into orbit into space, we had the maximum number, more or less, the maximum number of sunspots ever observed. But after that, with exception with the following solar cycle, things started to decrease. The sun, the sun started to get bore, boring, right? So now it's getting lower and lower. And, and if you look, if so you move your head a little bit behind like this, you can see another period. So you have the solar cycle period, more or less 11, 12 years, when you have one maximum and then the other, right? So you have more or less 11, 12 years. But if you move your head a little bit behind, you see another peak, like, so you see a peak here, then another peak here, and most likely, you have another one here. So I'm off the screen, the screen now. So what? So this cycle is called the Gleisberg cycle. It, it is more or less like 80 to 90 years, the period of the cycle. So it's still early because our reliable observations started in early 1800s or so, sunspot observations. We don't have many solar cycles and we don't have many Gleisberg cycles to make very strong uh, statements about this. But most likely, not only past data, but models predict that solar cycle is going to increase in the future because we're going down here, we're going past through the minimum of the Gleisberg cycle, then the ramp will go up again. 
But there is another thing that's happening. So solar activity is decreasing, but our human dependence on technology is increasing. But then this ramp is going to go up again. And when that happens, we need to be very well prepared because we will have many, many more satellites in space, uh, ground infrastructure, and we need to take care of these uh, human assets in space on the ground because space weather effects will become more and more extreme, more and more uh, stronger in the future. And we need to be very prepared for that. That's why we need more uh, to train more uh, scientists and people to work on this in the future. Okay, oh, I forgot I had some, some arrows here. So that's the 11 year solar cycle. And then we have the other Glasberg cycle, 88 to 90 years, okay? So that's it. So I think we are almost one hour. And so these are my conclusions of the, this talk. So I'm going to leave you here to read. But I think um, for the future, I think one, one of the main tools we need to proceed in this future and also to uh, create tools to protect satellites in space, we need to use machine learning, our AI techniques, data simulation techniques, because this is where we showed we've has them. Only 75 satellites we did a very good job. Imagine if we use thousands and thousands of satellites, we can do a way better job, but we need data. We are getting data, but we need more people to work on these data sets. And later today, I think Alison is going to talk about this. I'll be glad to talk to um, graduate students in postdoc and career postdocs about possibilities of working with this data here. And I'll leave it here. Thank you. And oh, yeah. And by the way, I'll get any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Danny. It was very nice presentation. And uh, uh, we do have some questions at the chat. Uh, we'll read the first one from James Bunn. Um, he is asking for the ADT calculation. How big is the uncertainty due to the drag coefficient relative to other terms? That's a good question, Jim. I don't know how to answer that now because I don't calculate the drag coefficients. I take drag coefficients from, uh, from the estimate, estimates made by Eric Sutton, uh, that, who is now in the University of Colorado. He has some technique. But but I think I, I think it's not only the ADT, Jim. I think the, the, the question would be density. So how CD would affect density? So because the ADT is derived from density, but then you have CD, you have to use CD back to calculate the ADT, right? So I understand your concern, your concern. Uh, yes, I think, um, by the way, just calculating CD is another science in itself. It's very complicated. People spend their careers just studying these aerodynamics things. But yes, so I, I, I would have to read some of Eric's papers, but I think there is some impact. But I would say, Jim, the impact is minimal. The impact is minimal of CD on density calculation and subsequently on DATDT calculations. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Danny. Uh, the other question is from Eurico de Paula. Uh, he asks, what about the MSIS model? Uh, that's MSIS, Alison. That's how we call it, uh, MSIS. Sorry, sorry about that. No, just pronouncing how the way we pronounce here. No problem. You, you, it's OK. Thank you. So the MSIS model, Eurico, so the problem is, MCS is a very, very uh, it computes density under a highly average regime, right? So it moves out density completely. So for short term, MCS doesn't do a nice job. Like uh, if you want to predict like some sudden variations in 
thermal CO2, for example, sudden variations of thermal CO2 density in high latitudes due to compression, but in interplanetary shock or something. So the model fails, it doesn't reproduce that. But if you want to study some climatology in long-term regime, MSC is, is great. But for this kind of analysis we're doing here, MSC does a poor job. I think that's your question. And we, we tried to do something, but it was so off that we decided not to publish the results because they, they made no sense. But we looked at MSCs as well. Okay, uh, I think in the chat, we you know, have any more questions? Uh, anyone in the audience wants to ask a question? Reinaldo, uh, are, you, are you in the waiting list for, for asking a question? No. Uh, yes. Yes, Thank go you. on. Okay. Hi, Danny. Uh, could you comment how the TGA component in the Yakia Bowman Depends on the ST, uh, that's a kind of functional or? Okay, so yeah, I ask, I ask Rinaldo, I asked the same question, Bruce. By the way, so let me do something before I, I answer your question. So these are the references. This is Bruce Bowman. So I dedicate the talk that I just gave to Bruce Bowman. He, he belonged to the Air Force. And he was responsible for, for developing this model. And he passed away on the last day of December 31st after a long battle against cancer. So I dedicate that to Bruce. And I asked this very question. I asked Bruce this very que same question. Why? So let me get your the check back, chat back. Yes. Why did you not use image? He said, I don't know. DSD was the index that worked best, period. So that's what he told me. So I, I got very more reliable, much more reliable results with DSD. So the way, so the, the model calculates the, the component, the contribution for geomagnetic activity is through some correlations, right? So there's some spherical harmonics, some complicated way, but what the model does is when DST is, is higher than minus 75 in nanotesla, nanotesla, the model uses AP to calculate density. When the dense, when DST goes below minus 75 in nanotesla, the model switches over to DST. So it's just by correlation. So you can check for more details how how this model cal calculates density, I mean, the, the GA contribution to the exosphere temperature in his paper, in his 2008 paper. If you are interested, I highly recommend you to take a look at the paper. Okay, okay, okay. thanks very much. That's yeah. a nice piece of work, congratulations. We can talk about applications of deep learning because we have a team in lab for computer and applied mathematics, many students working on PhD and uh, also masters uh, in this area. So I'm very excited to discuss with you, maybe a, a collaborate project to FAPESP or something like that. That's nice, nice to hear that, thank you. Thank you. So uh, I, I have a quick question on my own. Uh, so the duration of the storm is, seems to be very important for the drag of the satellite, right? So do you think in the Starlink uh, event that was an important uh, feature of the, the event or? I do, I do. As you can see, or although the storm was, was weak, it lasted for some time. I think it caused some, yeah, but it's, it's early to make these assumptions because it's just DST that I quickly plotted, but I still need to look at aurora index, indices and other things. But yes, Alison, I think the storm duration might have played a role here, but we need to look at other satellites and other indices as well to make this conclusion. Thanks. Uh, Jim Spann, can... can... Yeah, I was just going to comment on that. I, I agree exactly with what uh, Denny said. And um, there's been some analysis done by some of the folks at Goddard um, and the Moon to Mars office, where they showed that there was 
uh, initially due to this um, CME, uh, a shock occurred and then a little bit later, some flux tube interaction took place, which essentially elongated or prolonged the um, activity of the storm, which uh, I think played into um, such a minor storm uh, uh, having a, a larger impact than perhaps was anticipated. Oh, that's nice for you. Thank you, Jen. Okay, so I think we don't have any more questions. If anyone wants to ask a final question, yeah, Jose, go on. I have a quick question. Then what about the solar structures and try to understand if not only a strong or long duration a geomagnetic storm, but a specific configuration of solar wind could be more... Uh, Oh, I see. I see your point. So let's see. Yeah. Uh, for example, one thing that we haven't done yet is compare CME-driven storms with CIR-driven storms, like uh, something. rotating yeah. in, uh, interaction regions. Yes, and Marquesi, I think that um, CIRs, because remember Borovsky and Denton, 2005 or six. Pardon me. So geomagnetic CME driven storms are short lasted, but they are stronger. As opposed to CIR driven storms, they are weaker, but they last longer. So we need exactly. to look into that. Yeah, we need yeah. to look into that. In, in my opinion, if we do an overall like a long term analysis, I think CIRs will play a more impactful yeah. effect right. on the atmosphere. We still need Is to look into that. Sometimes there's a, a configuration of uh, both CME and CIR. Is some it appears some like the case of the Starlink uh, storms because you have two decreases of uh, DST index, something something like that. Yeah, yeah. It could be caused by a compression. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but but then the compression should be like a sudden impulse. So you should increase. Yeah, you don't. Uh, instead of decreasing it. Yeah. I thought about that, but I need, as I said, I need to look at other solar in, um, geomagnetic right. indices. For example, CMH, these indices are not available yet. Well, as at least I couldn't find them today, yesterday when I was making this plot. I just found uh, the ST, but let's see if I can find later uh, AE and AL and see if there was a substorm, if the satellite was crossing the RR region when we had these uh, enhancements and we can look into that later. But those are very preliminary results. All right. Oh, are you, are you looking for, are you showing something to us now, Danny? No. No, I- Ah, okay, sorry, I'm misunderstood. I can okay. stop sharing if you want, you want me to. Okay. Okay, so I think there are no more questions. And um, so at this point, I would like to thank again all the audience, all the participants for uh, at these seminars. And on behalf of IMPI and on the Space Geophysics Postgraduate Program we have at our institute and the Research in Heliophysics project we have in our internationalization uh, CAPIS project, I would like to thank Dr. Daniel Oliveira once again for this uh, excellent presentation and uh, we will have a meeting in this afternoon with the students and the postdocs of INPI and uh, I will send you the link shortly after this uh, uh, meeting here, okay? So, Danny, thank you very much. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado, Alison. Thank you very much for, for everybody for watching. Yeah, we had quite a good audience here, like uh, 35 people. I think that's the maximum number I saw. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So see you, see you, see you all next time. Uh, so, you, so you're going to send the link at? Yes, uh, I will. At, you you receive it by email. Okay. 2 p.m. there. Yes. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye.